This is what I mean when I say the ups and the downs. Um, I, I love talking to you guys before and after services, and so I'll walk up, and oftentimes the conversation goes like this, like, hey, what's up, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Oh, okay. How's school? And if everything is good, like I passed my AP whatever, or I have 100%, or I'm class ranked, you know, top percentile, you're like, oh yeah, school's great, it's awesome. Oh, cool. But then like the next semester rolls around, same person walk up like, hey, how's school going? And what happened is they started the taking the class that was invented by Satan, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and they're like, ah, school. And so in one semester, everything's great. And the next one, ah, it's, it's kind of an up and a down thing. Sports teams go through ups and downs. At some point, your team has probably won a championship or at least been in the playoffs. And maybe now they're in a down season. You know, it's amazing. Who knew that the Philadelphia Eagles would be first in the NFC East? What is that all about? I mean, that's ridiculous, right? A couple years ago, the New York Giants won the Super Bowl and they won like one game so far this year. It's, it's amazing. There's just ups and downs. Ups and downs. Almost like a roller coaster. The weather, especially valley weather. Have you noticed? You could fry an egg on the parking lot, and then five minutes later, you need a hoodie. You know, it changes <laughs> so fast. It's up and down, up and down. It's crazy. Well, life can be a lot like this. Friendships can be like this. We're going to be my best friend forever. And the next minute, you're like, well, I don't know what happened. Just, it changes. And specifically, you know, in your teen years, there's just a lot going on. There's a lot that changes. When you're about to graduate, there's a big change. Uh, maybe this year some of you moved schools or you started something different. Whatever the case may be, life is full of ups and downs. And kind of one of the points that I want to make tonight is it's not that one is better or worse than the other. The ups are obviously way more fun. But it's not like one is better than the other. Or if you're in the middle or if you're down right now, it's not that you know, you're know you living in sin or anything like that. It's just something that we do need to talk about because it can actually be really discouraging. In our walk with God. There are times where it can feel like we're up, and everything is great, and then there are other times where it feels like we're down, and you start questioning, you ask yourself, is he even real? You will have moments like this. Your pastor has had moments like this, where you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, and it's almost like your prayer goes up, and then it like boomerangs back around, and you're like, wait, no, that thing needs to get to God, and they just can't get... You're praying, and it feels like he's not answering. You're praying, and it's like... Sometimes you pray for a specific thing, but then the opposite things happen. And you're like, what, what is that all about, right? I mean, it can be up and down, kind of a roller coaster. So this is what I want to talk about tonight. First, let's talk about the ups. Some of the things that can be considered spiritually up would be what I would call like a spiritual encounter. Um, it's big terminology for like a God moment or... Maybe it's a church service, and you're sitting here, and you're, you're singing a song, and it's not just a song. It's not like you've sung it before because you have sung it before, but it's like this time something just hits you. Maybe you, you get goosebumps, or you just, uh, some people say they feel like God is in the room, the presence of God. Something is going on. You're just like, Phew. maybe it comes whenever you're reading your Bible. You all read your Bible, right? You're reading your Bible, and it's like something off that that passage of scripture, it's like a cartoon that comes out and it's like, hey, 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 this is for you, you know, and, and you see it, you read it, and you're like, God spoke to me through the Bible. I remember the first time that happened. I was laying on my bed. I was like 14 years old. I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. And I grabbed the nearest pin closest to me. I started underlying. I was like, that is good. And I kept reading. There was something else. I was like, what? I mean, it was amazing. I was an up moment, spiritual encounter. Maybe it's a prayer time that you have. Like you just have it and you just feel God's presence. Or maybe you go and somebody prays for you and they pray real hard and you're like, Ooh. it's just it's so good, a spiritual encounter. That's an up moment. You can call that. Uh, maybe another one would be like a, a, a spiritually up moment would be a time of just growth. You remember when you were a little kid and you were so frustrated because you couldn't see over the counter at McDonald's? You remember this moment? Right, and so your little hands could reach up there, and you like tried to kick, and you're like, eh, see over there. it was so frustrating because you weren't tall enough to see over the counter. Maybe it was just me, but it's just frustrating. And then you hit a growth spurt, and your pants, you know, they become like capris, and you go to McDonald's, and all of a sudden, like, yes, I can see over the counter. You know, it's so exciting because you grew. I don't know if your parents did this, but they take you to like a spot in the house, and you stand up tall, and they like measure your head, you know. 
And so you, you like counting the marks, and the next time you're like, I am going to get to, you know, four feet tall when I be a little kid. You get there, you're like, yes, four feet. The next day you go to school, you're like, hey. Yeah, like, growth is fun. First time you make a three-pointer, I, I brought one of my kids up here, Parker, he's six years old. The first time he'd ever made a basket on a 10-foot goal, right? Me and Mac were playing at the other end, and I looked all the way down the court. He was on the other side, and he, like, chunked it like this. Swished it from the other end of the court. I was like, Parker, that's awesome. Scared him half to death. But then once he realized, like, I was happy, he goes, yeah, you know, it was, it's a cool moment of growth. His little muscles are getting stronger. He can chunk that thing up there now, you know? Growth is fun. And spiritually speaking, isn't it fun? Whenever you've been praying about this thing and you pray about, pray about, pray about it, you're like, God, help me, help me, help me, help me. And then he does. Like, that's fun. Maybe it's an area of temptation that's just always been there. And, you know, the temptation comes and you're like, Neh. you know, like you just go to it and go to it and go to it. But then you've been praying and you grow spiritually. And the next time it comes, you're like, yeah, I'm good. Oh, like that. That's an up moment. That is good. I think anytime you make a big commitment before God, uh, that that's definitely an up moment. That's exciting. You know, for those of you that have been baptized in water, that's a cool moment because you are publicly declaring that you love Jesus and that you're going to follow Jesus. Hey, that's that's a good moment. That's it's a powerful moment. You get the T-shirt. Your family's there. They take pictures. Me, boy. Like, they're excited you got baptized. We have a baptism coming up. So not this Wednesday, the next Wednesday. Like, some of you guys are going to get baptized. If you want to get baptized, talk to me after service. We'll get baptized. But that is a powerful up moment. You'll remember that for the rest of your life. You'll remember the day that you got baptized, that you went public with your faith. Weddings. That's a time of commitment. Last week, I did a wedding. I preached at a wedding. I officiated the wedding. The bride, she's all decked out in her dress. And trying to walk up the stairs and that thing almost wiped out but it's all good she didn't wipe out uh they get there they exchange rings they say i do i pronounce them you know my husband and wife like that's a powerful up moment nobody gets married is like well that's like you know like i mean <laughs> that's a cool moment you're committing for the guy you're committing to take care of your bride forever and treasure her and protect her and lead her spirit that's a powerful moment it's good stuff all those things are good all those things are up. Obviously, the greatest moment you could ever have is when you decide to publicly confess that Jesus is your Lord. Whenever you come to a place of understanding where you're like, you know what, I realize I've sinned and I need a Savior. Romans 10, 9, it says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's not maybe. That's not strong person. No, that's you will be saved. That's a powerful, eternity-changing moment when you do that right there. If you've never done that, do that. Like, it is so beautiful. Those things that we're talking about, those are all up moments. Those are good. But life isn't just filled with up moments. Ideally, you get married once. So death do you part, right? Nobody wakes up, you know, girls, you dream of a wedding day. I want to have no, like you want to get married once to the guy of your dreams, and you want to be married and grow old together and make out with dentures, right? Like you want to do that. And baptism, you know, you can get baptized several times. You were baptized as a baby, but you didn't really understand it. You can get rebaptized; it's totally fine. But every month, you know, when it rolls around, like get a swimming pool. Like you don't have to go. You know, <laughs> but it's just a couple, maybe once or a couple times you get baptized. Here's what I'm trying to say: life is filled with a lot of middle. And sometimes down moments, ups, middles, and downs. It's true. And so how do you handle the downs? What are, what are downs? I think there's some different contributing factors to down moments. You know, some of them, it's just because life happens. This morning, Saturday morning, this morning, 10 o'clock, I, uh, I preached at the funeral of a lady. She's 93 years old. She had 10 kids, a whole bunch of grandkids. She loved Jesus. She loved the band. She loved cooking tamales. She was awesome, right? She passed away. She went to be with Jesus. And so we gathered around the graveside, prayed together with the family. That's a, that's a down moment for those that are here. For her family, there was tears shed because she was such a wonderful lady. They're going to miss her. The grandkids are there. They're going to miss her. That's one of those moments where you're, it's down. 
for them. By the way, for her, it's up. <laughs> because literally, she is up in heaven, her body, 93-year-old body with aches and pains and knees and all that, like, back, my back. You know, she, she has no more bad back. She is in heaven. That's up for her. But for everybody else, like, I get it. I get it. If you lose a loved one, that's not a fun moment. It's ups and downs, right? So sometimes life just happens. Sometimes you just get sick, right? There's nothing fun about being sick. It just, it's sickening being sick, right? You have a cough or you have to go to the hospital. Or it's just not fun. It's just life. It's, it is what it is. Some people get sick more than others. <laughs> like, what is wrong with me? I don't know. Vitamin C and Jesus. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes the down moments can be self-inflicted. Meaning God's blessed you and he's given you, say, great friends. And you're just a jerk. And your friends don't want to be around you. Well, don't blame God for that. Like, how could you look at that? Well, you did. You know? uh, that one's on you. Sometimes you blow an opportunity. An opportunity is presented, and you just you don't handle it well. You get lazy. You know, your senior year, and you're like, oh, I guess I should apply for college. Maybe you know, it's like, oh, well, yeah, yeah. You should you should do some things right. There are down moments. So here's a couple questions to ask yourself if you find yourself in a down moment. And if you're good right now, awesome. Happy for you. But you will hit a down moment. So here's a couple things you can ask yourself if you're taking notes. First one is this. Is the down my fault? Just ask yourself, is, is the down my fault? Is the situation I'm in, is it my fault? Is it because I was a jerk? Did I blow the opportunity? Did I do something wrong? It's just healthy evaluation. Don't immediately blame God and say, how could you let this happen to me? Right? You know, just ask yourself. But it's amazing. I don't know if some people are born with this inclination, but some people just naturally blame everyone else for something. Have you ever met these people? <clears throat> I have one of my kids that does this. Right? They throw a punch. They hit their brother. It's his fault. They're like, did he possess you and make you throw the punch at himself? Like, what is wrong with you? No. Like, it's not everyone else's fault. It's not the. I hear this one all the time. It's the teacher, really. Really, it's the teacher. You flaunt because the teacher. Come on. YouTube it or something. <laughs> is it my fault? Is, is, is there something that I could have done? Great prayer to pray. We talked about before. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in a way of everlasting. I love that part where it says, Search me. In other words, just check, check out my heart. Check out my motive. Show me if something's wrong. Did you know God does that? Okay. If you ask him to show you how you can grow or how you can change, he will do it. He'll speak through other people. He'll speak through the Bible. He'll speak through a message. He'll speak to your heart, and you'll just know, like, oh, man, I need to, I need to work on that. I want to get better at that. Another question you can ask yourself is, what can I learn from the down? If you're just in a downtime, what can you learn from it? Life doesn't just happen to you, and you don't just cruise through life. You, you should think about, okay, well, what can I learn from this situation? You can always learn something. Anyone in the world can learn something from anyone in the world. Okay. Think about that statement. The richest guy in the world could learn something from the poorest guy in the world. You can learn something. It takes humbling yourself. It takes putting, you know, just having an open mind. But learn something about this situation. Another question to ask yourself is, is this just a natural part of life? Like the example I gave a couple minutes ago. Are you sad because it's just sad? Are you down just because it just is what it is? It's nobody's fault. It's just life. It's the cycle of life. And then, last question. Ask yourself, is this part of my spiritual journey? Is this part of my spiritual journey? What I mean by that is, there are times, even in the Bible, where people went through down times that was perfectly part of God's plan. It was exactly what he wanted them to do. You think about Moses. Okay, real, real brief. The story of Moses was he was living in Egypt as a prince and he tried to fix a scenario on his own strength and it ends up killing someone. Not exactly a great move. Right? He tries to cover it up and, and you know, there's a lot to the story. But anyway, he ends up having to run. And so he runs literally out into the desert just to get away from everyone. And he lived there, check it out, 40 years. 
that's a long time. 40 years, it was like double your lifetime plus song, right? 40 years. Well, here's what was happening. While he's in the desert for 40 years, he was changing. He was being shaped into a person that God could eventually use. So after 40 years of hanging out in the desert, he got married, had some kids at this point. He's just working. He becomes a shepherd, so literally he's taking care of sheep. The Bible says that he's out in there one day, and he sees this bush that is on fire, but it's not burned up. It's not like a campfire that burns, or you're making s'mores ready to burn, and then it goes out. No, this thing burns and burns and burns and burns and burns. It's not burning up, so it catches Moses' attention. So he goes over to check it out, literally, this bush that's on fire. God speaks through the bush. God uses this phenomenon to speak to Moses. It says, Moses, take your sandals off because you're standing on holy ground. In other words, your feet are dirty. You've been walking around in sheep poop. Like, get that off. Like, stand on holy ground. So Moses obeys, right? The burning bush, God's speaking. You're going to do whatever he says, right? Or else you're going to get in fuego. And so he takes his sandals off, and he stands there. God speaks to him and says, hey, i got a plan for you. It's time. You're ready. Go back to Egypt. Why? Because my people are still there. you got to lead them out. Here's the point. That time in the desert, that, that was for a reason. Moses eventually got to the place to where he wasn't going to try and do something in his own strength. He wasn't going to go back and kill people with his bare hands like he tried before. He was going to go back and let God use him and speak through him. You look at the life of Jesus. <coughs> Jesus, did you know, Jesus went into the desert also for 40 days. And he fasted. He didn't eat anything for 40 days. He got baptized, went in the desert. It was a severe time of temptation. It's recorded in the scripture that Satan comes and tries to tempt Jesus, and tries to get him to mess up, tries to ruin the plan. Jesus doesn't give in. He passes that successfully. And after 40 days, that's when he begins his ministry. He calls his disciples. In other words, Jesus went through this time in the desert. You would call that a downtime in the desert before he began his ministry. It was almost like a time of preparation. So ask yourself, is what I'm going through simply part of my spiritual journey? I'll give you a personal example. When I was 12, I just turned 12. I went up on the roof of my house with my dad in an effort to help him fix something. We had kind of like a hole in the roof and sort of patching things. The problem was I was wearing chocolate and uh, we had this skylight uh, on the house and we measured it later, but it was about 11 foot drop from where the skylight was to a hard tile floor. So I'm up there as a 12 year old, I was chubby and heavy and stuff, still am. But I was up there, and so I was paying attention to my dad. He was over here. We were trying to fix the roof, and I'm, like, handing him stuff. And so there was this time I went to step back. The problem was I stepped onto the skylight. And skylights are, like, really flimsy, and they're not solid. And so I fell through the skylight. And on the way down, I went, Arr! and so my dad, just like in a movie, he turns around, and I wasn't there. He's like, what? Did the rapture happen? No, because Michael wouldn't go, but I was here. But anyway, he, he turns around, and I'm not there. And so he looks through the hole. Anyway, what had happened is, in my trunk was I fell back, I hit, broke both bones in my leg, dislocated my ankle, like it was nasty. Gordon Hayward, nasty, right? Like, ugh. You ended up having to have two surgeries, I was only cast for like almost two months, rehab, the whole thing. You talk about like, ugh. I'm 12. I'm playing hockey at this point in my life. Like, I'm ready to go. Like, come on, let's do things, you know? Sit in a chair for two months. Finally, after the second surgery, I get out of the cast. My foot, my leg was so weak, and the bottom of my foot, all those nerves in there were so bruised and messed up, and they hadn't had any pressure on them, that it just hurt to put my foot down. So I walked like a gangster, I mean, like with a limp, for like three months after that, just seriously, like, ah, ah. Couldn't play hockey forever. I remember the first time I put skates on, like, I could, it just, I cried. I'm like, this is so frustrating. Well, you know what? I look back on that now, that time period of several months, and it was really good for me, spiritually. Because I had to learn to fix my attitude. Because I wanted to complain, and I wanted to be frustrated. I got depressed, not clinically, but I was just always just down. Like, this stinks, man. This stupid injury can't do anything, right? Literally, my parents had to help me take a shower. You know how embarrassing that is? Like, get out of here, Rito. It's just not fun. It was almost like being in the desert. 
but going through that helped make me the person that I am today because I learned a lot of spiritual lessons through that. That's my point. Is there a time that God can teach you stuff in the middle of the downtimes? Let me give you one more example of scripture because it, this is why I'm going to give you this. Is because some of you think that, like, when you go to pray, you're like, okay, I'm going to have quiet time for God. So I wake up early in the morning, you wake up early in the morning before you go to school or whatever, you get your Bible out and you read, and you're like, okay. But you kind of zone out whenever you read, and you're like, uh. You're like, okay, I'm going to pray. So you start praying, and you're praying like good prayers. These aren't bad prayers, right? You're praying good prayers, you're praying for good things, maybe you throw a worship song on, you're like singing or whatever, and then you feel nothing. That can be a frustrating moment. Like maybe I'm just having an off day, so I'll, we'll go again tomorrow, right? Or I'll pray later before I go to bed. But then it happens again and again and again. And so you start thinking, is there something wrong with me? Like, are my prayers not good enough? Is there sin in my life? You know what I mean? Like, is God mad at me? What am I doing wrong? And then sure enough, you come to church and your friend is like, man, I just read this Bible verse. It's like, God spoke to me. And you're like, I hate you. In the name of Jesus, right? Like, oh, you're so frustrated. <laughs> And you just, you start wondering, is there something wrong with me? Maybe this Jesus thing works for them, but not for me. Literally, I've had students tell me that before. There used to be a dude that sat in that third chair right there. Raised his hand, worship God. He, he came in, actually, and said, I just want you guys to know I'm not, I'm not coming back. I'm like, why? He's like, this church thing is not for me. Leads, he hasn't been back since. Broke my heart. I'm like, dude, it is for you. But he had this moment of frustration, like I think some of you are having. So let me tell you a story that hopefully will just kind of blow that thought up for you. Remember the guy that baptized Jesus? His name was John the Baptist. He's actually a cousin of Jesus. He's a powerful preacher. He would preach and people would literally change their lives. He would, I mean, I already said it, but he was the one that baptized Jesus. He baptized other people. He's in the Bible, right? Powerful man of God. Awesome dude. Well, he gets arrested for being a Christian. Herod, who was the Roman dude that was in charge of the land at this time, he arrests John because John was preaching, and John actually called him out. He's like, hey, you're living in sin because Herod had divorced his wife and married his brother's wife, and all creepy, it's like a novella. Anyway, John goes, that's wrong, like you're lusty, like stop, you can't do that, right? And so Herod gets mad, and he's like, I'm going to throw you in jail. So he puts him in jail. It's a true story, read in the Bible. Throws him in jail. <clears throat> okay, John is in jail because he's done nothing wrong. He's committed no crime. He hasn't done anything. What he said was true. All he's doing is saying truth. Well, meanwhile, while John's in jail, Jesus is out doing the Jesus thing. He's preaching. He's baptizing people. People are being healed. Literally, people that can't walk are walking. Blind people are seeing. I mean, just miracle after miracle because he's Jesus. Well, John hears what's happening out there that Jesus is doing these amazing powerful things and John's sitting in this prison cell and he starts to wonder how come I'm not getting out of here like I'm, I didn't do anything wrong Jesus come come like bust me out <laughs> like come on we're cousins I don't think I was mean to him when we were a little kid yeah no we're good like I mean come on like get me out get me out get me out nothing happened so the Bible says that John literally, this is found in Matthew eleven three. 3, John sends his, his helpers, they were his disciples, to go and ask Jesus this question. Matthew eleven three, 3, he says, go ask them, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? So he tells his disciples to go ask Jesus if he was really Jesus. Can you imagine the look on the disciples' face? They would have been like, you're crazy, bro. Like, seriously, you want us to go ask him? Yes, just go ask him. Okay. So his disciples, the story is his disciples, they go up to Jesus, and I can just imagine Jesus with a line of people doing miracle, 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 you know, miraculous thing, dead people getting raised from the dead or whatever, and they walk up and they're like, yeah, stupid question, but John wants us to ask you, are you Jesus? Like, yes, I'm Jesus. But anyway, they go and they do this. Jesus' response to them is so incredibly compassionate, and it's relevant to us. Jesus doesn't answer sarcastically and say, yes, go tell John, of course I am, I'm Jesus. No. In verse 4, Matthew eleven four, 4, Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. Go back and tell John that crippled people are walking, the blind are seeing, miracles are happening. Yes, go 
go back and find him. His disciples evidently go, yes, sir, we're leaving. And as they turn to go away, Jesus says one more thing in verse 5. He said, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Verse 6, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Blessed is the man who doesn't fall away from the faith on account of me. What? Because what Jesus is saying is that things in our life may actually happen that would call us, cause us to be discouraged. Things in our life that God could fix might actually happen that would cause us to stumble and fall away. And Jesus calls it in this moment. He, in other words, what he's saying is, I could go bust John out. I'm Jesus. But I'm not going to. That's a big deal. Right and so they go back. They tell John what's up. John never gets out of jail. John actually is beheaded in jail. Now, we know exactly where he went. He went to heaven. He better to go to heaven than live on earth. So in the end, John wins. But from an earthly standpoint, it didn't get better for John. And by the way, it wasn't like John had done bad. Look at Matthew 11, verse 11. It says, I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, and that's kind of like everyone. Get it? No? Okay. Yeah. yeah, among those born of women, which is everyone, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So here's, here's the point. Jesus says, John the Baptist was the best ever. And I'm still not going to answer every prayer of his. I'm, I'm just not going to bust him out. And he's going to be blessed if his faith isn't messed up because of that. In other words, if he stays faithful, even though I'm not going to answer his prayers, that's a good thing. So here's my point. If John the Baptist didn't have all of his prayers answered exactly how he wanted them to, don't get frustrated when God doesn't answer every prayer exactly like you want them answered. And you will be blessed if you don't stumble as a result of that. In other words, if you stay faithful even when God isn't doing exactly what you want him to, there's blessing in that. There's hope in that. Sometimes in life, you're going to have ups. Sometimes you're going to have downs. Maybe the downs are your fault. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just part of life. Maybe they're just part of God's plan. But in the middle of it all, just stay faithful. Here's the deal. When you sit down to pray, like I talked about a couple minutes ago, you wake up early for school, you get your Bible out, you read it, you pray. If you feel God, awesome. If you feel him there, great. But do you realize that even if you don't feel him there, he is still there? Even if you, like, the Bible doesn't speak to you and it's not, like, underlying worthy in that moment, right? It's still the Bible. It's still truth. It still builds you. If you pray and it feels like the prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and you have to, like, dodge them because they're going to hit you in the face, right? There's it's still part. God still hears and he still cares. One of the tempting things when it comes to the ups and downs is to fall in love with the feeling of God more than God. What do I mean by that? Let me give you a quote from John of the Cross with a long time ago. He said, our tendency is to become attached to feelings of and about God mistaking them for God himself. These sensations, rich or empty, are not God, but only messengers from God that speak to us of him. There is no other way for our souls to be strengthened and purified so that we don't worship our feelings and then for God to remove them altogether. We better what, what he's saying is, you sit down to pray, and like God speaks to me, and you get the goosebumps, and you're like, yeah, it's good. Well, do you like the goosebumps, or do you like God who gives the goosebumps? Are you praying to God, 
Or are you praying for the goosebumps? And what he's saying, and what's on the screen is, if you're just going after the feeling of the goosebumps, and you just want to feel God, or you just want to know that he's close, well, there's no greater way for you to grow spiritually than for God to take away the goosebumps, to see what you're really made of. My wife, right before we got married, she went through this season. She described it this way. It was like 10 months where she would pray and felt nothing. And she was, everything we talked about tonight, she felt frustrated, something wrong with me. She fasted, like literally she didn't eat food. And she was praying instead of eating food. Like she did all this stuff. Nothing. But she would look back, she looked back on it. She's like, I've never grown more spiritually than that time. And I remember the Sunday morning in the other building, we were standing there, and it like he broke or something. And she was jump, she never jumps, but she was jumping in the middle of worship, and it was like, oh, she got the goosebumps back. It's great. But the point was, who do you really love? And so to sum up what we're talking about tonight, your life will be filled with ups and downs, both naturally and I believe also spiritually. There will be times where you sense God incredibly close, and there will be times where you wonder, is he even real or around? But in the middle of it all, just like John the Baptist, you're actually blessed whenever you remain faithful. And maybe, just maybe, you're going through a season where you don't feel the goosebumps, but that actually has a purpose. I want you guys to fall in love with Jesus. I want you to be faithful to Jesus. And if you get goosebumps in the process, correct it. But love Jesus through the ups and downs. Amen? Amen. So let me pray for you now. So God, tonight's a tough one. Because we like the goosebumps. We like the ups. We like feeling and pleasures. But sometimes we just won't. But through it all, I pray that we would stay faithful to you. That we would worship you no matter what. That our character would waver no matter what. But that we would just grow through it all. If we're in a downtime right now, then I pray that we be faithful through it. If it's self-inflicted, that we fix it. We do whatever we have to do. So God, help us with these things. Thank you for the examples of Scripture. We pray this faith and strength over each one of these guys. In Jesus' name. Everybody said Hey, two announcements before we get out of here. Um, in a month, on a Friday night, we're doing the youth conference. If you don't know what the youth conference is, it's like a, uh, <laughs> on Wednesday I described it as a turbo boost and a video game. Um, it's going to be awesome. There's going to be some breakout sessions for you guys to choose from, different topics, depending on what grade you're in, and stuff like that. So worship is going to be killer. I want you guys to come on a Friday night and get more information and sign up by the hub. The other thing is, if you'd like to give them an offering, you can do so right here on the way out. Thanks for being here tonight. You are just